Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. This is actually part two. On the last lesson that I did on Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, I believe I ended with White Lines. White Lines dropped in 83, and that song was oddly credited to Grandmaster and Melly Mel. Um, Flash was already out of the scene and proceeding with his, his, his court thing to uh, get out of his contract. The group was starting to splinter at that point. I believe Raheem told me that if you listen closely to the record, some of his vocals, uh, his singing is actually were, was left on the tracks. Um, so it, it kind of shows you that at the point when they started working on that record, the group was still, you know, uh, together in, in some form or fashion. But I think it was Scorpio that told me that the, the name Grandmaster and Melly Mel was an attempt by Sylvia and, and Sugar Hill Records to, um, you know, kind of deceive the public into thinking that Flash was still there. Because, you know, in all fairness, Flash, uh, his name did help to establish, you know, many of those hit records. I mean, all the hit records, his name was on them. And then with Mel, um, right at the message, you know, you started to see the credits turn funny. You know, um, every record they did was credited to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, except for some reason, Flash to the Beat was only credited to Grandmaster Flash. And um, in, in talking to a couple of the brothers, and I, again, I think it was Scorpio said that sometimes the credits would go funny. Like if you did something to make Sylvia mad or somebody, you know, an executive at the label upset, you know, mainly Sylvia. Uh, your, your credit might not be, uh, you know, there the next time. So I don't know if that was the case with uh, the Furious Five not being on Flash to the Beat because clearly they're all on that record. But anyway, um, all the records with the exception of that record have been credited to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Then right at the message, you started to see Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five featuring Duke Booty, and then you would see uh, the message to survival, you know, with the Duke Booty name, and then New York, New York might have been Melly Mel and Duke Booty. So you started to see, just looking at the credits on the records and listening to the records, the dissension in the group. And it, it all came about right at, at the time of the message and because of the message. And, uh, you know, the, the, the way the group, uh, the music of the group was taken off into the stratosphere, but, you know, the rest of the members, you know, kind of felt like they were in the back seat at that point. Some of that, you know, um, you know, just in my interviewing them, you know, could have been their own fault because everybody had a chance to do the message. You know, um, the message was floated around the label. Uh, Sugar Hill Gang was offered the message. Everybody was offered the message. The message was so different at that time because all the songs were about, you know, partying and having a good time, up tempos and, and just good times that, you know, the message was just something that was so foreign to everybody. And on top of that, the original demo that, that Ed Fletcher, AKA Duke Booty was floating around at the time had like congas and it was more like a, uh, like a last poet's almost spoken word thing before it took form of what it would actually be. So um, you can look, you can get all of that from um, the lesson I did on Grandmaster Flash and the Furry Side. The first one, I go into more detail. And if you look at um, why Melly Mel is the greatest of all time, you'll see a lot of good information there too. So I can't dwell too much on that because I got a lot to cover here because we're dealing mostly on this part with the breakups and the solo careers and solo releases of many of the, the members of the group. So Flash went to court. I believe he had a, a, a issue with the fact that Melly Mel was calling himself Grandmaster. You know, a judge ruled that Grandmaster is um, a title and not a name. So, you know, Mel was able to to keep Grandmaster Melly Mel. Flash, of course, came to Sugar Hill Records with his name. You know, the reason that uh, Sugar Hill Records was actually able to retain the name uh, Sugar Hill Gang at that time, and actually uh, Master G and Wonder Mike, as of now, uh, have their name back. But the reason they were able to retain that name, kind of like, you know, the Jackson 5, when they left Motown, they had to call themselves the Jacksons because Motown owned the rights to that name and they wouldn't relinquish it. Same thing with uh, Sugar Hill. Um, and to go even further into some Sugar Hill slash uh, Sylvia history, one of her groups, The Moments, um, I believe they were on um, her Stang uh, imprint or maybe Turbo. They might've released on a couple of her labels because she had several labels. And at one point I'll definitely do a message on Sylvia and her labels because she goes so much further back than just uh, just rap records. But anyway, um, Ray Goodman and Brown were, were originally called The Moments, but that's a name that she bestowed upon them. So when they left her record label, 
um, they had to change their name. So they changed it to Ray Goodman and Brown. Well, Sugar Hill Gang, same thing. You know, she made up the name Sugar Hill Gang and gave it to them. So when they left the label, um, or when that group disintegrated, you know, she retained the name. But Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five came to the label with the name. So when the split happened, uh, Grandmaster Flash formed a new group, uh, or sort of a new group, and the group was just called Grandmaster Flash. No, no Furious Five, just Grandmaster Flash. And it consisted of Flash, Raheem, who was an original, you know, from the original group, Kid Creole, who was Melly Mel's brother, who was an original, and then they got new members. The new members were LaVon, Mr. Broadway, and a dancer named Larry Love. So that was the group Grandmaster Flash. There was a lot of confusion at that time on, on who was who. Um, I want to say that Mel and his faction started releasing music first. I'm pretty sure they did because they were already on Sugar Hill. They, they never really left. You know, From what I, I've heard different stories and the uh, consensus that I get from talking to everybody involved, you know, at one point, everybody walked. At one point, the whole group was just going to leave Sugar Hill Records because, you know, they felt royalties weren't right from all the records they had sold and the message and, and everything. If they felt that the uh, the royalties weren't right. So everybody was going to walk. And I think Mel might have been the first one to go back. Then Scorpio went back with Mel. And then Cowboy said, you know, I'm going to stay with uh, Scorp and Mel. And then, you know, of course, Flash had already gone. And Raheem and Creo thought they'd have a better situation staying with Flash. So because they were already situated in a deal, I believe that uh, Mel, Scorpio, and Cowboy had a bit of a jump on Flash's faction. Now, Mel, Scorpio, and Cowboy, their group, which was now called Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five, they had an interesting lineup because they had those original members, but then they had they added Tommy Gunn, who was an interesting cat. I'm um I'm I'm cool with Tommy Gunn. I've interviewed Tommy Gunn. He's just an interesting guy. He's a punk rocker. He at one point he was into the porno industry. He's done some of everything. But just not a guy you thought would be uh, in a rap group, especially a rap group like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, or at this point, the Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five. But if you look at the Beat Street movie, when they're doing Beat Street Breakdown, you see a guy with uh, kind of outlandish hair, and he might be blowing fire or something, because he used to do little magic tricks and stuff on stage, too. I think he was just more of, of the visual, uh, you know, was the, the attraction, um, you know, to the group. Or the attraction that whoever said he'd be a good fit for the group, I think the attraction was the look, because he definitely had a unique look. Definitely would have been better placed in a rock band than, than, a, than a, a, a rap group at the time. But he did, uh, you know, magic on stage and things of that nature. So that was Tommy Gunn. He had Kamikaze, who really didn't stand out as much as Tommy Gunn, but he, he didn't look like he belonged in the group. I remember the first time I saw the full-length album, uh, Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five was the title of it. Overseas, it was called Work Party, but in the States, it was called Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five. And this is the album I pointed out in, I believe, the uh, the lesson about Melly Mel, why he's the greatest. Um, Mel had a gun on the front of the album. And um, when I first saw it and I saw, you know, Tommy Gunn and I saw Kamikaze, I'm like, why are these guys here? You know, Kamikaze, he had he looked almost like he would be in like uh, <laughs> like a biker gang. Or in like um, West Side Story, or for those old enough to remember the TV show called Sha Na Na, something like that. You know, he had a leather jacket on in the front of the album, and you know, the haircut with the you know little curl coming down in the front. Definitely seemed to be a little misplaced, you know, in Grandmaster Flash in the Fury or Grandmaster Melly Mel in the Furious Five. And then you had um, Mel's brother King Lou uh, was part of the group at this point. Easy Mike, who was Flash's assistant um, originally, and I mentioned him in the uh the first lesson i did on grandmaster flash and the furious five easy mike was now the dj along with our uh, dynamite who played a few roles in um in the original grandmaster flash and the furious five dynamite was was cowboy's best friend dynamite was uh, an early mc in his own right and he was definitely there with hip-hop from day one of you ever of your social media friends with uh Dynamite, you'll see pictures of him with, you know, Bam Bada early, early on. Pictures of him in Hurt, pictures of him in Hollywood. All the the real um, 
practitioners and players you'll see dynamite with them and like i said you can go and look at some old flyers you'll see dynamite on there as an mc and again he was cowboy's best friend and uh played different positions in the group he was a roadie at some points he worked for um directly for uh for sylvia um taking care of things for the for the furious so um dynamite became a part of the group and a dj in the group as well I believe Dynamite has the best photo album in the, in the hip hop world. I mean, he's got all the pictures from back then, pictures of the guys when they were like teenagers, you know, touring, touring the world, you know, and then you got pictures with cats like Jay-Z and Russell Simmons. I mean, he's just an all around, you know, hip hop uh, impresario, uh, so to speak. So that was Dynamite. And then if you listen to Step Off, you will hear the name Clayton Savage who was uh, musically did a lot in the group and a lot with that particular uh, album, that self-titled album. And Clayton Savage is definitely a good friend of mine and a musical collaborator. I've done some music with Clayton Savage and he's a, he's definitely a good friend. He's a multi-instrumentalist from right here in Virginia. And he, again, plays some of everything. And I'll get later into how he fell into the group. So they had a, they had a different setup. I mean, you know, this is a, a group of guys that, um, you wouldn't think would be together in one group. So it was a, um, it was a different setup for a hip hop group, especially one of the first hip hop groups, um, you know, to ever do it. So in 1984, you had the, uh, that self-titled LP by Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five. And the standouts on that LP, one of them is one of Mel's best works. I mean, Mel still had a lot of solo stuff on, um, on this album, but World War III, um, I won't get too deep into World War Three because I covered it in Why Melly Mel is the Greatest of All Times. But I talk about World War Three a lot because, um, again, when I talk about Melly Mel being uh, prophetic with his lyrics and speaking on things that hadn't happened and kind of having this prophecy kind of gift, um, World War Three was one of those songs. Of course, we were under nuclear threat all throughout the Reagan uh, years, and rappers definitely talked about Reagan a lot in their records all throughout the 80s. Or that part of the 80s. You even had a song called Reaganomics. Um, you had all kinds of songs about Reagan. But, you know, we were under this threat of, of nuclear war. So he made Mel make, wrote this song called World War III. And in it, he talks about some of everything, you know, concerning that, that nuclear war threat. But he also talks about clones and drones and things that really, just in the last decade or less, started becoming household uh, words. But in the 80s, nobody was talking about clones or drones. And uh, Mel was definitely far ahead of his time on World War III. Realistically, the bombs are ready. Technically, nuclear by name, capability. A total destructive, radioactive, death in flame. Veils talk of a fiery doom. Prophesy since the dawn of time in the world of bloodshed. Mass confusion, killer diseases, pollution and crime. Yeah, so like I said, on um, on the lesson uh, on Melly Mel, why Melly Mel is the greatest of all time, I, I talked about a couple of these songs, so I won't spend a lot of time on these songs. Um, I've gone over another song on there, and I always say this was the song. I wish they made the whole album more in this vein because this is 84. Um, Run DMC is taking over the Profile Groups, uh, which was the record label that Run DMC recorded from, Profile Records. A lot of the uh, groups on Profile Records are using like heavy drum machine um, production, you know, mainly via Pumpkin, uh, rest in peace, the producer. Um, and just, you know, a lot of a lot of groups at this point have abandoned uh, the bands of, uh, of those old record labels and they're just rhyming over drums. And I wish they had done that on this album here with, uh, with Mel and the Furious Five. But they did do it on one song, a song called The Truth. And on The Truth, they're using the same beat 
that the Boogie Boys used for Breakdancer um, on, on their album. Everybody got a, ch- a chance to shine. It was definitely a good record for 84, and I wish that it could have got better promotion and things of that nature because some good rhymes, some really good rhymes were said on it. Mel was in battle mode as always. Um, his brother King Lou got a chance to really shine on it. One of the few times we really heard him, you know, get down. So uh, the truth was a really good record. Rap is our way of life. That's why we do what we like. Born to rock the mic like EF Hot, so don't say nothing. Hey, take me out while I run my game. There's not another MC can make me feel shame. My name is Cowboy, not giving no slack. I'm like four, five, six, better known as head crap. I've been rocking that party eight years of my life. Got shot with the gun, stabbed with the knife. Had to pay my dues, had to learn the rules. Had to separate the smart from all of the food. We were talking behind my back and never. To my face, but to make a clear path when I step in the place, I can make them clap their hands, stomp their feet, make them party to the rhythm seven days a week, make them shiver and shake just like an earthquake, make the people dance without a mistake. I can cruise around the world all across the nation, get a big kick out of time, participate, make them hit to the hop and all that stuff. Cause the other MCs know I'm just too much. My eyes are brown, my legs are bold. I can tell the MC right where to go. It's for cool to run through my veins. I got that's what a bunch so I show no shame. Shine, slaying other MCs with this style rhymes. A G is for great to describe this man. My name is King Blue. I got a master plan. And from the shores to pack, but still the streets to main. There's a certain reputation I got to maintain. I got to write good rhymes and say them well. And if I don't do that, I know I'll fail. There's a few things I use to get me over. They all fit together like a fault leaf clover. First and most important is visionality. You gotta be innovative. What's the time can be? Huh. Second on my list, you got to know how to fake. You got to make the crowd yell. Cause a major earthquake. Make them stop on the floor. So yeah, the truth. That was uh, that was literally the truth. And I think a few more like that on the album might have kept them in the game a little bit longer. It's no telling because you know Sugar Hill Records was at that point just about to to close their doors down. Um, like the next year, uh, '85, you know the MCA merger and everything with Sugar Hill, and you know this is the last you know last few joints um, dropped on the label. And on this LP, uh, Melly Mel did a great reworking of Hustlers Convention which was actually by a lightning rod from uh, from The Last Poets. And Hustler's Convention was a full LP um, where lightning rod just went through and told his whole elaborate story about these hustlers and, you know, their whole life and going to this Hustler's Convention and and how their lives ended. And Mel took basically the whole album and condensed it down into a song. He did an excellent reworking of it. And the band at that time, which was a skeleton of what the band used to be. I know Doug Wimbish was still playing with the band and perhaps a few more of the original guys, but by this time they had Clayton Savage and a few few new guys, uh, you know, composing the band, but they did an excellent reworking of a Hustlers Convention. Well, you get my you see the full moon in the middle of June, in the summer of 79, I was young and cool and shot a bad game of pool and hustled all the chumps I could find. Well, now they call me sport, cause I pushed the bars short and loved all the women to death. I partied hard and packed a mean rod that could knock you out with the right or left. Now I learned to be cool while playing hooky from school at the tender age of nine. And by the time I was 11, I could pad roll a seven and down a whole quarter wine. I was making it a point to smoke me a joint. At least once during the course of a day And I was snorting scag While other kids played tag And my elders went to church to pray I pitched pennies and down bennies And played the horses at the track I won the cards against tremendous odds And my favorite game was blackjack I'd sell the laws Cause my game was so boss
Now, all of the albums on the Sugar Hill label, the full length albums in the early days, they were more like compilations. You know, you have most of the songs were songs that had been released um, in previous years and it may be one or two new songs. And the excitement of those uh, so-called albums were like uh, the, the album covers because you never got a chance to really see the artist on the singles. You just saw the actual um, record label logo. So when they did a, did a Sugar Hill album or album on that label, it was always exciting just to see what the, the cats looked like because those of us outside of the Tri-States, we, we, we didn't get a chance to really see these cats until they came through to our towns to actually play. Now this album was a little different. The only thing that had been previously released was they had a, a so-called remix of White Lines, which is mainly the, like the instrumental or dub version. It w wasn't really a remix, but they would do that, you know, as a marketing thing just to get you to buy it because, you know, White Lines was a, was a hot record. So this album was a little different because it contained mostly new material, but the material was all over the place. I mean, you had a couple of ballads, which were like, uh, that was a standard for, for the Sugar Hill rap album. You know, the Sugar Hill Gang LP would have a ballad or two. The Crash Crew had some unreleased ballads. Um, Furious Five always had one or two ballads. Even on the Message album, they had ballads where, you know, Raheem was doing most of the singing on them. By this time, Raheem had left. He had Clayton Savage doing a lot of the, the singing work on some of the songs, but they were all over the place. You had something as hip hop as the truth, and then something as R and B as a "We Don't Work for Free." And "We Don't Work for Free" was actually a single off of the LP. And this single, you know, I loved it because I was a, a big fan of Prince early. Uh, you know, I was as much a fan of Prince as I was of hip hop. And a lot of cats at that time, they were like undercover Prince fans because, you know, Prince was so controversial, especially with his image when he first came out. So a lot of a lot of street cats and hip hop cats, they they like Prince on the low. But I openly was a Prince fan. So I really liked We Don't Work For Free, but I don't know if the fan base of the Furious Five was really ready for a song like that. It sounded it sounded like a Prince song. Um, musically, it sounded like something that would have been on the Controversy album. Uh, vocally, it, it was just like a Prince song. And, and Clayton Savage told me in my interview with him that that's how he got his deal. He was shopping uh, his demo at the time, and he was going to all the big uh, record companies in New York and in that area. And he ended up in New Jersey at Sugar Hill Records. And he sat in the lobby, and he gave his demo tape to uh, Joey Robinson Jr., who was uh, Sylvia Robinson's son. Uh, rest in peace to both of them. And he said, uh, you know, he listened to it and he heard We Don't Work For Free. And he was taken by it. He said, Mommy, listen to this, listen to this. And that's how Clayton Savage got on at Sugar Hill Records, was on the strength of We Don't Work For Free. And he ended up doing some uh, productions, um, mainly with The Furious Five. And he was like a member at that point of The Furious Five. Again, he got name checked on uh, on Step Off at the end when uh, on Mel's last verse when he says, Kamikaze, Clayton Savage, and Easy Mike. You know, he's naming all the different members of the group. Um, also, he did some work for uh, Shantae, who I believe was um, in The Last Dragon, I want to say. She was a singer that was signed to Sugar Hill Records. He did a lot of work with the Osley Brothers, who was always hanging around the Sugar Hill Studios, Bunny Sigler. You know, he did a lot of work over there at Sugar Hill. But anyway, um, We Don't Work For Free was a different record that, um, you know, it... it, 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 it it fit on the album because the album was kind of out there anyway, but I don't know if it fit well as a Furious Five song. In the darkness of night, huh, all the stage lights are shining bright. Hey, and we work very hard to make you stay rough. But it ain't no thing, y'all, because I know that you can hang. We're not too expensive, but you got to pay. Rough. Greedy. Ooh, you say 
<laughs> I give Clayton a hard time about that song every time we uh, <laughs> every time we talk music, but it's definitely all out of respect and love. That's my um, that's my man, and uh, and that was my joint. I mean, it's, it's an honor to uh, have grown up on this music and to be in a position to uh, have developed musical friendships and real friendships with the cats that were you know so much a part of it and who actually made it you know it's uh, it's almost a surreal thing but uh yeah yeah me and me and me and clayton we cut up about uh, we don't work for free but that was that was the joint so moving on for every lesson that i do at the very end of the lesson i'll just play a random song to close the the lesson out this is a song that i like by the artist not necessarily their best song but just a song that i like and that closes the lesson out so because of time constraints and i still got to get to the you know, Flash and his his side of the breakup and the solo stuff that the, the different uh, members of the group put out. I still got more on Melly Mel's faction. At the end of this lesson, I'm gonna cover the new adventures on the Wheels of Steel. And, or New Adventures of Grandmaster was the title of the song. And what it was, uh, briefly, the adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel from 81, that was the song that was like the game changer for like really the, the hip hop culture especially in a commercial way. Most people that weren't from uh, the New York area had never heard scratching. And uh, this was the first time that scratching had been commercially available um, in any kind of format. And this was you know, something that Flash wanted. He wanted to do a cut record. He was cutting and mixing. And I always say that the Adventures on the Wheels of Steel is the closest that we got at that time to, or probably ever, uh, to hearing what the original... Uh, a hip hop party would sound like if you could actually put audio in, in the form of capturing what hip hop was 1981's uh, Adventures on the Wheel, Wheels would be that I would say um, you know, a lot of scratching and mixing first time it had been done a lot of cutting um, a lot of people became DJs off of that record especially a lot of people uh, outside of New York so if you go back and look at my first lesson on Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, I talk a little more at length about the impact of Adventures on the Wheels. So the new Adventures of Grandmaster was just something to piggyback off of that. This is three or four years later, three years later. And not as much cutting and scratching or mixing on this one. It was a lot of little vocal snippets um, from this album, you know, different vocal snippets of, of different group members, you know, a lot of uh, talking and, you know, kind of bugging out over it. But the magic of this record was the drum machine programming. It sounded like a Lin drum, maybe, but it had the signature hand clap that was popular at that time on records like AMPM and Do or Die Bed Style by Divine Sounds. You know, it had that hand clap. And I wish they had made a real serious record out of it because this um, Adventures on the Wheels, New Adventures of Grandmaster, I should say, and The Truth were very much in the vein of what was going on at that time. And Sugar Hill, you know, after probably 83, was always lagging behind what was popular in uh, in, the, in the sound of rap at that time. But they would have been right in the pocket if they had done everything in that vein. But um, I guess that just wasn't meant to be. So at the end of this lesson, I will, I will play the whole uh, entire version of the new adventures of the Grandmaster. And that was on the same uh, Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five self-titled LP from 84. Now, 84 and 85 seem to be extremely uh, busy times for these cats. They really didn't appear to play around at all. After the breakup, it looks like they got right to work. And I went through the the, the bigger songs on the, um, the self-titled LP, but there were two or three songs from the same year in the same time period uh, that weren't on the LP. Two of them were on a single from the uh, Beat Street movie. And of course, you had Beat Street Breakdown, which I'm not going to get into at all because I got into it really, really extensively on the uh, uh, Melly Mel lesson. But I will say this, and I forgot this on the Melly Mel lesson, and I could kick myself because it really would have been worth doing the lesson over, but it was just, it, it was too late by the time I caught it. I don't know how I missed it, but when I was speaking of the greatness of Melly Mel and how he prophesized things, I missed his greatest prophecy, which was on Beat Street Breakdown. There was a line when he said, learn from the past and work for the future and don't be a slave to no computer because the children of man inherit the land and the future of the world is in your hands. And the personal computer wasn't even something that almost any households had at that time. We're talking 1980. 
84, probably 83 when he wrote it. Um, computers were big, like, you know, in like corporate America and military and, 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 and bigger, you know, on a more macro level. But on a personal level for people, computers were perhaps taking over jobs. If you go back and look at uh, or listen to Problems of the World by the Fearless Four, um, Microphone Wizard DLB talked about computers taking people's jobs. Another prophetic MC, especially on that song, Problems of the World. But there was no internet. We were probably 12, 13 years away from the internet in 84. So uh, that was a great lyric by Melody Mel, because look where we are. So I think the greatest, as far as people talking about computers and computers taking over and making a prophecy like that in hip hop, definitely would have been DLB on Problems of the World. Um, my man, uh, my main man, Cosmo D from Nucleus with Computer Age did a whole song uh, discussing this very thing right around the same time and then Mel on Beat Street Breakdown. The flip side of Beat Street Breakdown was internationally known, which was one of my favorites by, by the, the Furious. The Furious, you know, they had a thing where they would do like harmonizing and R&B type stuff, but it'll still be in the vein of hip hop. And internationally known was definitely that. They were rhyming on it, but more so harmonizing. Almost like a, like an extension of what they did on Flash to the Beat. Um, and it had the beat, I think was a group called the LA Boppers. I think they were, um, you know, doing an interpolation or replaying of uh, a beat, a popular break beat by the LA Boppers. But internationally known was, uh, it was a high record. It got it got a little airplay. You know, B Street Breakdown got daytime airplay, which still in 84 for rap, you know, unless you were Run DMC or Houdini, there wasn't a whole lot of daytime or fat boys maybe at that time. Daytime, primetime airplay for rap music. But B Street Breakdown got major airplay. And internationally known was 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 snuck in there, you know, a, a lot too on, on daytime FM radio, which was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? And the other song from 84 that wasn't on that album, but that was a, a, a big hit for the Furious Five, or Grandmaster Melly Mel and his new Furious Five, was definitely Step Off. And Step Off was like a top 10 hit in the UK. It was an international hit, even more so than it was here in, uh, in the States. But Step Off, I'm not gonna play a lot of that either because you can catch that on the, um, on the Melly Mel lesson. But Step Off was, um, Step Off was a great song. One of the last great uh, songs on Sugar Hill. This was 84. Um, the last few great songs was Step Off, uh, Gotta Rock by The Treacherous Three. Um, Busy Bee's Groove was, was kind of in the pocket, like, you know, in that pocket of sounding like what was current at the time. So, um, and then, of course, Pump Me Up, which I'll talk about in a few by The Furious Five. So, one of the last great uh, records on the label. But Step Off was um, musically based on For the Love of Money by uh, the OJs. And interestingly, there's a song called King Heroin by the Funky 4 Plus 1, later done solo by Jazzy Jeff from the Funky 4 Plus 1. 
but there's an unreleased version <laughs> on uh, that Sugar Hill put out later on overseas, and it had the exact same backing track with the uh, For the Love of Money beat. And on Step Off, um, again, that's Clayton Savage singing the um, the hook. He's not saying money, money, money. He's just doing a little chant in the same rhythm. Um, and that that's, again, my man Clayton doing that. And um, dope rhymes on Step Off. Step Off was one of their better songs. I wish there could have been a version of Step Off with the original group um, instead of just, you know, Mel Cowboy and Scorpio. I wish... I wish Creole and Raheem could have got some of Step Off because that would have been uh, that would have been dope. Sitting on the corner just wasting my time And when I realized I was the king of the rhyme I got on the microphone And what do you see? Huh, the rest was my legacy I was born to be the king of the bebop swing That has stands in my dance Big diamond rings I own the castle in the yacht So if you go back to my lesson, why Grandmaster Melly Mel is the greatest of all time, you will definitely hear a little more of a breakdown of uh, Step Off on there. I've seen live performances of Step Off from back in the days where actually on the bass guitar is Scorpio playing. And Scorpio is accomplished um, on a couple instruments. I know on the back of the Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five self-titled album, he's credited with uh, a lot of the backing vocals. And he's also credited with some keyboard work. And I know he plays drums as well. In fact, I got to dig it up. I got a VHS tape of um, one of Quincy Jones's uh, jazz festivals. And um, he's actually playing drums with Quincy and Melly Mel and some more people. And he's, he's damn good on the drums. So, uh, yeah, in addition to being a MC in the Furious Five and one of the, one of the originals, you know, from when they were the uh, three MCs, he's a very musical cat. And like I said, I, I started seeing a little bit more of that on this particular album. In 85, they did a single, uh, Pump Me Up, which was just basically Trouble Funk was affiliated with Sugar Hill Records. Trouble Funk originally did Pump Me Up on their own label. They did it on a, three or four different labels back in the uh, back in 79, 80. Um, and then they got a little distribution type deal through Sugar Hill Records, probably around 81, 82. So they re-released Pump Me Up. So basically, in essence, Sugar Hill Records had the rights to the musical tracks from Pump Me Up. And Grandmaster Melly Mel, uh, Cowboy, and Scorpio did their own version of Pump Me Up. Again, you can check that on uh, Melly Mel Lesson, but I'll play a snippet of it here. Rappers might be willing, but they ain't able Cause I was that king straight from my cradle I screamed and hollered and shook my rattle And dreamt of defeating them all in battle There was no food in my silver spoon So I grew up hard and I grew up soon I'm a righteous king, but I'm hungry too And I eat up chumps that rap like you Then I met this shark and his name was John He was biting my rhymes like y'all bite y'all I started writing my rhymes, the shark grew and grew But I was writing more rhymes than the shark could chew huh, The shark got sick and then he exploded cause he didn't knew the king was me i got a certain cool that breaks the rules that get me paid in a lot of jewels and the woman i call it day and night that's proof i'm getting mine like a thief in the night because scorp is known as the 
finger The quiet storm of that lover didn't linger I will not change cause it's in my blood I'm like dynamite and you a rapping dud And if the future is here in the making Then why I can't be part of the taking Cause you know I like cars and fancy women that give me good love In the beginning, a bubble bath in candlelight And girls saying, Scorp, you alright So stop standing there like you're from above And just relax yourself and get in this tub so also in 85, Mel had a record called King of the Streets. It was a very good record. Um, timely, you know, um, beat-wise, definitely. Um, Rhyme-wise, definitely, you know, just a braggadocious record about, you know, how, how Mel was the king of the streets. And this is before rap went anything like Thug, so it wasn't from that point of view of being the king of the streets. But it was, uh, you could YouTube it. I won't cover it here, only in fairness to the rest of the group, because it was a Melly Mel solo record. And after the message, you know, he started getting, you know, so many basically solo records. And this was a straight solo record. But just for the purposes of letting you know what was happening in 85, I mentioned King of the Streets. So it's something you might want to check out on YouTube. My original intent was to go straight chronological and go into the solo stuff that everybody did. But I'll put the solo stuff at the end of the whole lesson because I still haven't even gotten to Flash's side of the group. And they, they made quite a few records as well. So in 85, Grandmaster Flash, his group was just called Grandmaster Flash. And again, that was Grandmaster Flash himself, Raheem, Kid Creole, a dancer named Larry Love, an MC named Mr. Broadway, and an MC named LeVon. So you had, you know, three cast from the original lineup, and then they added the, uh, the new guys. So the album was called, they said it couldn't be done, and it was on Electra Records. Which was a big deal at the time because Electra was one of the you know one of the good majors. Um, rappers had been on major labels before that. Curtis Blow was the first solo MC to score a major uh, deal with Polygram. First group was the Fearless Four, and that was on Electra as well. So of course the title they said it couldn't be done was basically saying, you know, everybody thought that once the group split up, there's no way, you know, that you're going to survive. There's no way you can do it. You know, maybe Flash was saying, I, and that's one thing I never got a chance to really ask Flash when I talked to him, but perhaps people were saying to him, you know, it'll never be done without Mel. You can't do it without Mel. Because there were those whisperings, you know, because Mel had became the star of the group after the message. So perhaps there were people saying without Mel, you can't do it. And the title of the album was they said it couldn't be done. Now, one thing about Flash's faction, their stuff was a little more polished musically. And I'm not saying that the musicians were necessarily better, but it was purposely more uh, R&B um, infused than what the Furious Five were doing. The Furious Five, they had their stripped down records like The Truth, and Step Off was a bit stripped down. Um, and they had a few others. Even though they still had a band as well, the stuff that Flash was doing was just purposely just more, um, I won't say for an adult crowd, but it was definitely um, more R&B infused than what, what, what Mel and his faction were doing. Now, the first single off of They Said It Couldn't Be Done was Sign of the Times. And very much in the vein of the message trying to go with the social commentary, it was nowhere near as gritty and raw as the message. I mean, the message was just very raw and gritty. I mean, people pissing on the stairs, you know, it was very, very, uh, from a ghetto point of view. Sign of the Times was more of from a world point of view, almost like Curtis Mayfield on uh, Future Shock, you know, just talking about the world is messed up. That was more what Sign of the Times was. And it was done over a beat. Um, they replayed a song by Lilo Thomas, who's an R&B artist, and the song was called Sexy Girl. So if you go back and listen to Sexy Girl by Lilo Thomas, you'll hear the bass line that they used for Sign of the Times. Sign of the Times had a very uh, very good video. You know, they, they, they took a long time to see rap seriously, even after rappers got major deals. And you just didn't get a lot of good videos I go back. You didn't get videos, even when rappers were on major labels. You just, you know, just didn't get videos at a point. Um, so, you know, the, some of the luckier ones, um, Fearless Four had a good video for Problems of the World, but most most rappers, even on major labels, just didn't have videos. But Sign of the Times did have a video, and um, it was an interesting video. I'll play it as I play the song. Now listen up, because I got a little something to say to educate you about the life. In the streets today, but everybody's confused about what to do and what this world is coming to. to. Inflation rises every time the opportunity. 
that he knocks the rent's crazy for the house the size of a box it's an arm and a leg to keep clothes on your back the daily run push and shove you just can't hack when payday comes to rap you go to pick up a check your money never sees a pocket it's all out on deck he be shot the president he had nothing to lose wanted Jody to see him on the eyewitness news cops shoot up all of the sitters set to find out the next day the guy's in a set the young girl's being raped and taken by force but all the people getting married just to get Yeah, so on their album, they had production by Flash was doing production and then Gavin Christopher, uh, rest in peace. I think he died a couple years ago. Uh, he was a R&B cat that was doing uh, production. So again, they, their album was a little more decidedly, uh, decidedly R&B than what Melanin were doing. Now, Sign of the Times, you know, it got okay reception. It was a little bit chilly reception, you know, um, especially when Mel and them had already had a jump start, getting some of their stuff out. Um, and their stuff was, you know, a little more on the hardcore side. So Sign of the Times, I could see what they were trying to do, being that the group was known for social commentary. And here Flash is entering this, you know, arena with, with you know, a new group, essentially, and a major label. They probably wanted to try to, you know, capitalize off that, you know, records like The Message and White Lines and New York, New York, and The Message 2, you know, the, the the social commentary that the public had become accustomed to. But it just wasn't a strong record for a first single, so the reception was a little chilly. I think they should have released Girls Love the Way He Spins first, but they did release that as a single. Probably was the second single, I'm pretty sure it was. And that was the one, even though it was a little R&B as well, uh, you know, we got a chance to hear Flash do do a little more cutting, you know, more than he did on Sugar Hill, even though he did Adventures on the Wheels on Sugar Hill and on This Is Shame, he did some scratching, but, you know, he just didn't do a lot on the records on, on Sugar Hill. And that was one of his big gripes is that, you know, he had all these ideas that he wasn't able to execute on Sugar Hill. So here at Electra, he had pretty much free reign to his production ideas and his cutting ideas. So... Girls Love the Way He Spins was an ode to Grandmaster Flash and his cutting skills, and it was a very good record. Speed is what you need. If finesse is what you want on a post, that's the other rap. About the bad Flash! They got to the ladies to play. Yeah, that was the one. That was the one that made us say, you know, that made us believers. You know, I remember being in middle school and just waiting for Flash's, you know, faction of the group to drop. And um, like I said, Sign of the Times wasn't the one that made me say, okay, they can do it. But Girls Love the Way He Spins, you know, definitely. Because Sign of the Times, I believe, dropped before the whole album. And then the whole, you know, because that was the first single. And the whole album dropped. And Girls Love the Way He Spins was the next single, I'm pretty sure. And, you know, just hear him cut up Release Yourself and everything else he cut up on that album, that was on that song. That was uh, that was great. That's one thing that Mel's faction didn't have was the cutting and scratching. They had cutting and scratching. They had uh, 
Leland Robinson, who's one of Sylvia's sons, uh, called himself Vicious Lee. He cut on some of their records. Um, in fact, on Step Off, you can hear him cutting up, and Mel actually you know, says his name on the record. And you had Easy Mike, who was Flash's assistant back in the days, um, and you know one of his best friends. He was doing some stuff, but Sugar Hill just wasn't, I'm gonna probably blame the label, it was just reluctant to have a lot of cutting and scratching in the records. And um, on Electra, Flash was able to really get down. And what they did also, there was a song called Larry's Dance Thing. We all know it as Larry Love, but the actual song full title was Larry's Dance Thing. And Larry's Dance Thing was just about Larry Love, who was their, their B-boy, their break dancer, uh, which B-boys were later christened break dancers by the mainstream. But uh, he did more popping and that kind of stuff than break dancing. But in this era of the Fresh Fest and all that kind of stuff, which Flash's group was able to capitalize off the Fresh Fest, which was a tour that went around with uh, Run DMC, the Fat Boys, Houdini, Nucleus, groups like that. Um, and Flash and them had a couple dates um, on the Fresh Fest. That's another thing that Mel and them weren't able to capitalize off. So, you know, Flash and them got in some pockets that Mel and them didn't. And um, they were able to capitalize off of the uh, the Fresh Fest and things like that. And having Larry Love there because the Fresh Fest was heavily based on, you know, um, the break dancing of the day was part of it. You know, they had a few break dancers and poppers. One of them was Jermaine Dupree, a young Jermaine Dupree, who, of course, ended up being the CEO of uh, So So Deaf Records. But anyway, uh, so so they were they were, you know, Mel and his faction had their advantages and Flash and his faction had their advantages. But Larry's dance theme originally on the album, they said it couldn't be done. It was just a little instrumental two or three minute song. And here's a snippet of it. So if you heard those few bars there that I just played for you, that was the song. If you heard that, you, 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 it was not much more to hear. It was almost used like filler, like a little two or three minute little piece of filler for the album. But the group and the record label was getting such a feedback that, hey, we really liked the Larry Love song. Um, you know, we really liked it. So what they did, again, that was on the album. When they made, went to make the single for Girls Love the Way He Spins, they did a remix, which was kind of rare back in those days. A remix back in those days was not like what a remix is now, where you go and add vocals or add different parts or switch the beat or anything like that. A remix back then was just what it was. They just mixed it again. It might have extended a piece or whatever, but never like flipping the whole record. But they did a remix of uh, Larry's Dance Theme and they actually wrote a whole song. The original one had no vocals, it was just an instrumental snippet. And now they wrote this song specifically about Larry and his dance skills. Ladies and gentlemen, back by popular demand, here to rock the motherland, the summit of all electronic dancers, along with the Grandmaster Flash is here with you tonight. And if you want to party, get up, clap your hands, while we do it for you, something like this.
a very wise decision to extend that song and do a remix of sorts and put it on the, the B side of Girls Love the Way He Spins. Um, a powerful 12 inch and a very redeeming 12 inch for this particular faction of the group. And on this song is very interesting. You know, in talking to different members of the group from both factions in more recent times, I've asked them, you know, how were things back then? Being that you had, you know, Mel and Creole are brothers, you know, Mel's in one faction, Creole's in another faction. I wanted to know from those brothers, you know, was there any beef? And there were times when, you know, things got a little, little hectic between the two groups and they would throw jabs back and forth. And one jab, um, I'll play it here. If the soldier blows, and if you fast pass, no man alive is faster than flash. If the fast pass, or if you slow you blow, Ooh. no one can rock the show like us for Creole, Raheem, Broadway, and LeBron. Instead of stepping off, you might get step on. Uh. If you're thinking about battling, you must learn. And if you play with fire, you're bound to get burned. That's what all time does in the spot nonstop. Like prevention, cause you're fit to see So yeah, that was a direct, you know, a diss at that time. You know, instead of stepping off, you might get stepped on. Because, of course, they had step off on the other faction. So, you know, some jabs were thrown back and forth. Another part of the record is something that Flash did. Now don't turn your head, because you just might miss Flash. Turn your sound, it goes like this. Of course, that was ain't no half stepping by Heat Wave, but you know he 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 cut that up nice, especially for the year for '85. That was extremely nice, and you know he came on with you know faster ain't ain't you know he 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 did it backwards and he brought it back forwards, and that was uh, everything we were looking for at that time. Everybody wanted good cutting and scratching off of records. That was back at the time when cats were dedicating songs um, to their DJs, much like Girls Love the Way He Spins. DJs were doing their own uh, instrumental tracks where they would just scratch over top of the tracks. You know, you had Mixmaster Ice and, you know, just, you know Howie T, the, all the Brooklyn DJs, and of course the Philly DJs were coming up at that time. So perfect for them to uh, let Flash show his ass on the records like that because he, he, he wouldn't have got a chance to do that, you know, over a Sugar Hill. So a uh, very powerful 12 inch by the group at that point. Again, this album was a very, very, um, this is an adult album. I mean, this is something I could have probably played for my parents at the time who, you know, they, they didn't hate rap, but they, they, they weren't, you know, the biggest fans of it either. I mean, they were grown people at the time and they just, you know, young people's music, but they would have enjoyed the musicality of, of some of it. Uh, very good stuff. They had a, a song called The Joint Is Jumping," which was um, just a very good song. Um, it's very musical. You can, you know, you can YouTube that. They had a song called Jail Bait. Um, where Ra it was a straight up R&B song. Raheem was singing about you know a girl that was too young for him. You know, street term jail bait. And they had a song called Alternate Groove, which was I think they released that as a single. And I wish that had been a bigger song because Alternate Groove, um, real heavy with the 808. And I don't mean the 808 kick drum, the deep bass. I mean just the 808 drum machine and um that electro style. It wasn't quite as fast as some of what you would call electro music but it had that feel to it with some harmonizing and some singing by Raheem. It was a really good song.
So yeah, they said it couldn't be done was a solid effort by Grandmaster Flash. I wondered always why they, the label would pick and choose what to make a video from, you know, uh, what songs to make a video for, I should say. Like they had a video for Sign of the Times, but they really should have had one for either Larry's dance theme or Girls Love the Way He Spins, or perhaps both. So that was a big misstep on the part of the record label to only have one video for the album. And by this time, um, you know, the video stations were, you know, MTV wouldn't have played it at this time. In 85, they, you know, they were just playing Run DMC's, like King of Rock, you know, that was one of, you know, and still playing Rock Box from the year before. But um, you did have uh, Donnie Simpson's uh, video soul and things like that were playing a lot of rap videos. And um, in fact, they would play some of Grandmaster Flash's later later videos, and I'll get to that. But um, it would have been a very, very smart move to make uh, more than one video from that album. But however, in 1986, the group made an album called The Source. And the lead single for that was a song called Style. And it had the music from uh, 007, you know, 007 theme music. And it was a really uh, hot song, big hit overseas. I, I remember that, and it was a big, a big enough hit here, and really got a lot of push on BET. I remember that early on that BET used to play that video a lot for uh, for style. We're Grandmaster Flash. We're giving you a blast of class. And the Carrington Styles not Gucci or Louis Vuitton Imported straight from the Bronx And my name's uh, Bond We all with a few words I like to voice And arsenal of rhymes my particular choice Got style and finesse And I'm sure you'll agree Nobody ever, never, ever rhymes quite like me We're Grandmaster Flash We're giving you a blast of class Again, in, uh, in 86, which is when this album dropped, um, and, and this song, um, Style, it was everything to hear Flash cutting Single Life by Cameo and cutting up um, Before I Let Go by Frankie Beverly and Maze. You know, to, to young kids now who've heard, uh, you know, what they call turntablism and scratching, you know, with the flares and everything and crab scratch, you know, all the different techniques, it's somewhere else now. So you might listen to these records if you don't have a good context and you don't know how you got to the point of these flares and transforming and everything that it came uh, from what Flash started, this is where it started. So, you know, people that don't have a context can hear this and say, oh, it's simple, he's just rubbing the record. But that was the most you could do at that point. You know, that was what it was time for at that time. You know, that's, that's what he created um, along with others, Theodore and others. And then it graduated to what you have now. Through, through several different people taking that baton and running with it. But at that time, nobody could rub a record like Flash. And it was really good to see him um, on Electra doing his thing. Definitely. Another song worthy of mention off of the Source album was a song called Freelance. Freelance was like the group taking it back to the feeling you had of like a, uh, a jam, a park jam. Um, you know, back in before rap records, you know, back in the in the mid to late seventies, um, and what they did on freelance, you had Flash just uh, backspinning different records, and you heard you heard him backspinning Bob James Mardi Gras, and at the time, people might have said, oh, you know, he's copying off Peter Piper by by Run DMC, but it's just very interesting that that was one of the breaks that Flash used to spend, you know, almost ten years previous to. Uh, to doing it on this record so freelance is is just showing you where it came from and that golden era 
of, of rap records that we talk about that occurred in the mid uh, the mid to late eighties to the nineties. The records they were using, this freelance record shows you this is what they were doing back in the seventies. And the reason the golden era was golden was because they were able to take technology and mimic what Flash and other DJs were doing back in the, in the 70s. So uh, Freelance was a very good record at that time. And yes, y'all, the sounds that you hear are the death to your ear. <laughs> so have no fear, because Flash is here. Disco dream of the mean machine. Ooh. The Darth Vader of the slide fader. No man of the world cut straighter or greater than New York's number one cut creator. Oh, yeah. But you don't get no money back Cause we can never be the whack That's why we talk stuff like that uh -huh. So please tease and squeeze all the young ladies uh -huh. Cause we're the four MCs that'll rock your own oh, down. Down. To the, to the, to the Ladies And again, the source was a solid album. Um, definitely style was a big deal for them. And like I said, that video and BET really um, was responsible uh, for a lot of the sales here in the States, probably most of them, because that, that video stayed in rotation on, uh, on Donnie Simpson's show. They also, on that album, they did a song called Larry's Dance Theme Part Two. And you know how those, those sequels are on songs. Sometimes it's better left you know, with, the, with the first one. And, Second one was okay, but it didn't get much attention. The, the first one was just, you know, you, you couldn't top it. Um, Behind Closed Doors was another one that got some radio play. It was like an R&B um, kind of love song almost. Um, you know, he rapped on it, but it was definitely more in the R&B vein. And uh, Fastest Man Alive is definitely another one worth going to YouTube and checking out. Again, Flash just doing some really good work with his hands on that. So in 87, uh, Grandmaster Flash came out with... Uh, but I Boom Bang was the name of the album. And the lead single was You Know What Time It Is. Now, it's very important. One thing I try to do on these, one reason I go so long and I'm so long-winded, I have to create the context. I'm not going to assume that everybody remembers everything and what everything was at the time. So I, I feel it's very important. I feel that's missing in a lot of conversations about rap music. Um, the context, what was available at the time. You know, you can't just take a piece out of out of these time periods and, and critique it without drawing a full picture of what was available at the time. Some of the stuff that's great was so great because it was so far beyond what else was out there. So the context I have to set for this is, this was uh, 87, I believe, uh, but, but I boom bang was 87. So by this time you had... Uh, that 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 next school, uh, which was like Big Daddy Kane, Rock Him, uh, Juice Crew, G Rap, these guys are, are coming up, and uh, you know KRS One, you know that was that that was that year, you know '88 was that year that everything was cemented, but the seeds were planted in '86 and '87. So uh, Eric B and Rock Him had dropped uh, President or Eric B for President, and check out my melody. So, of course, you know, once he dropped Paid in Full, Rakim just changed the whole cadence of the game, and you had a few people trying to sound like Rakim at the time. Um, there was some controversy with King Sun in the beginning because King Sun had a similar um, vocal inflection and cadence to, uh, to Rakim when he did uh, Hey Love and Mythological. Um, if you go back and check my Rakim uh, lesson, that was a pretty good lesson, one of the early ones I did. But everybody was... Not everybody, but a few people were trying to get that Rakim kind of 
kind of sound, you know, EPMD sounded a lot like that, not necessarily on purpose. They were all from, from Long Island, so, you know, who knows what that was. But there were comparisons drawn there. So on this one, you know, Grandmaster Flash as a group was definitely purposely trying to capitalize off of uh, the Rock Him sound, specifically Eric B as president. Because if you listen to the bass line on this song, is almost like the bass line that Eric B is president, which was really, I think, Fat Rat by, um, by Fonda Ray. But either, either way, the music and the cadence and the voices was purposely trying to capitalize off of uh, Eric B is president. And in talking to Raheem and asking about the record, he said the one thing he never liked about it was it was himself and I believe Mr. Broadway those two were the main MCs, and he was saying that Mr. Broadway didn't ride the beat well. And it's funny because I noticed that when the song was out. I, I knew one of them was Raheem, and I knew one of them was either Broadway or LeVon. And I was like, you know, this guy's falling off beat a lot. He definitely wasn't in the pocket, and I wish they had let Raheem have that one on his own. But, um, you know, this one had a kind of different video for like an animated video. You didn't see the group in the video. Um, it was an okay video. Played a lot on BET, and it was actually a, this was a pretty big hit for them. Played a lot on on commercial FM radio, you know, during the day, you know, good good airtime it got, and um, definitely because of of, of Eric B and Rock Hymns record. <laughs> Just get off the ball, let's have a ball. The 70s are gone, it's the 80s, y'all. Grab a flag by my hand and ask her to dance. Come on, fellas, don't be shy, just take a chance. You never know it might lead to romance. Cause the beat of cold stomping, it'll put you in a trance. You're so hypnotized that you stop and stare. Stepping out of this, cause I'm not with that veil. Get on the dance floor, come on, take a stand. All the girlies in the place want to dance with you, my man. Get on the floor and work it out if you can. Here's my ulterior motive, I mean my game plan. Doesn't hurt to flirt, just Go ahead and chase the skirt You can't help it, it's your line of work To get the women on the floor is you they adore You might as well give them what they came here for You know what time it is 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 Hang on, party people, cause here we go. We're gonna go take the party to another plateau. But in order for us to achieve a new height, we wanna hear Flash cut the beat up in that rock. While Flash is chopping the mix like an axe on the wood, you got to dance cause the beat is free to move. So yeah, undeniably that was a hot record. Even though it was a blatant um, capitalizing off of, of Rock Hymn's uh, cadence and everything, um, it, it was still it was still hot. Um, Badoo Boom Bang was uh, it was a sketchy record. This wasn't one of their better ones as an album. Um, Flash had a lot of solo stuff on here, and I think that saved it. I mean, because you know that's what we always wanted to hear was more of Flash's cutting. And um, Ain't We Funkin' Now was a like a, you know like a one minute little snippet he had where he's doing some uh, cuts and scratches just over a beat. No no MCs. Um, kid named Flash, he actually took the vocal piece that KRS-One said in South Bronx when he said on the other side of town was a kid named Flash. He actually took that and made a hook and just, you know, scratched up a bunch of stuff and that was real dope. And there's an extended version of that. All this is on YouTube. Um, they had a song, um, or another one of his songs was uh, Bust This, where he's just scratching and he's, you know, doing it very well at that. Also, another song uh, of his, a solo song, was uh, Ted Roof Off. And of course, he's scratching the old uh, Parliament Funkadelic uh, from, from uh, you know, from Ted Roof Off. So, um, again, a sketchy album. They had, like, you know, a few songs where they were trying to be comical, like, you know, a song called Underarms, and, you know, it's about, like about, you know, underarm odor. And, you know, um, kind of a little silliness like that. They had a song called Big Black Caddy, and that was like a metaphor. Um, you know, kind of a explicit song. You can use your imagination on that. So, you know, one of the more interesting things, they had a song called um, We Will Rob You that you can only get, like, on the extended CD. I don't think, it definitely wasn't on the vinyl at the time or, or the cassette. Um, I think they had a song called We Will Rock You where Flash was cutting, but they actually had a song called We Will Rob You um, on the CD, and it actually, like, you know, 
talking about robbing people. And, you know, comical at the time. Not, not, nothing thuggish about it or anything like that. But, um, you know, they, 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 were, they were definitely getting their comedy on on this album. And I think times were so serious at that time as far as MCs. Like, again, you know, you had some of the best MCs being born that year. You your Canes and your Rockhams and your KRS-1s. Everybody who's re- revered as a giant now, they were sowing their seeds in um, in, in '87. You know, LL, you know, it just dropped um, "Bigger and Duffer," which was one of his best records. So, you know, for them to come out with that much comical uh, content and that stuff, it just wasn't a, wasn't good timing for it. So that one kind of fell by the wayside. So now the whole time that Flash's faction is doing this stuff in like you know '86, '87, '88 as a group is quiet on the side you know of mel scorp and cowboy because sugar hill records is no more so they didn't have a recording home so you know scorpio did a few solo things and i go over those mel did some stuff here and there you know they had the artists against apartheid record um they had the king holiday record stuff like that you know a little spot spot things you know mel always stayed busy um scorp did some solo stuff here and there but it wasn't much as much going on on that side because they didn't have a recording home any longer for Melly Mel's faction. And they hadn't had one since 85. So in 1988, um, this is after a year after but not boom bang. Um, you know, I think it was Raheem who told me, look, you know, we decided to get back together because we saw the parade going by and we were getting you know left behind even though we were pioneers in this you know the first to do so many things it was moving on and we weren't you know we weren't participating we were just kind of sitting on the sidelines um so they decided to get back together and what flash did was you know he all the new members you know they were cut or whatever happened they they must have been cut clearly and then he brought cowboy mel and scorp back with him on electra and they had a nice, uh, a nice little reunion. It, the album could have been stronger. It was called "On the Strength." Came out really strong. The first single was "Gold." Gold was about that, about gold. You know, gold chains were really big at this time. This was, you know, '88. You know, everybody's wearing the truck jewelry, the big rope chains, and they made a song about gold. And um, they took it back to how they used to do it, splitting the words up between each other, making five MCs sound like one. It was really good. They brought the kazoos back like they had in, like, Birthday Party and Freedom. Um, Flash had actually uh, patented a mixer called a Flash Former. Again, if you remember, if you go back to my first Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five lesson, I talked about how Flash was a – he went to Samuel Gomper's uh, technical school and, you know, he was a electrical cat, a, a wizard when it came to technology. And he patented this technology. The Transformer Scratch was really popular. And it was something where you moved the crossfader and um, you manipulated the record. And it had this kind of sound like the sound was shorting out. Because that's what you were doing. You were just moving the fader really quick off and on. And what he did was just develop a technique where you're just basically pressing a button instead of moving the fader. So uh, he was using a Flashformer throughout that whole On The Strength album, doing a lot of Transformer scratches on it. Um, but Gold was definitely a good first single. And um, they rolled out a nice reunion, a nice a nice uh, promotional part of the reunion. Again, no video, especially uh, in 88. By that time, you had Yo! MTV raps and all of that stuff. You know, no video really hurt them, but... Uh, Goal was a strong lead single. With a one, two, three, four, five, MCs, MCs. MCs. Hey, yo, look at whole boy with that rope chain, man. Yo, that ain't real. That's slump. What? Yo, man, y'all seen the one inch thick lint jamming that be yeah, selling up on the corner? They be doogie? Damn, word. Stupid dumb gold chain. Yo, man, don't be knowing nothing about yo, 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 hold it, man. Let's, Let's just, just tell them about, about some gold. Look, feel, style to maintain. Brothers reaching the lines for a name chain. A young man dream fantasy or wish is to own a rope chain. Rope yes, chain. Rope chain. Throw it on his neck. Stand around. Got keep his man around. Many as they can around. Always got his hand around. A fly young lady with chain to swim. Earrings. Driving Mercedes. Rings on every finger like king. Queens in the passenger seat. Bunkies in the back selling crack to every kid on the street. Stand on the ab like an African prince. Huh. An ill child been wild ever since. The boy's dope. Look at the smile on his face. He got the gold teeth shining all over the place. Janet Jackson says that diamonds are a girl's best friend. But lo and behold, you know gold was meant for the men. A link chain, 
worn by an Italian, prancing like a stallion, a fat dromedarian, a diamond studded cross. Huh, here's the boss, he had to kill for his. Now you're going for yours, and you're outside the chip star. You wanna stick it up? Two kilo coast scores, you wanna pick it up? Girls give hugs because you got two of them, and now you're selling drugs. Cause you want a few of them. The things that you're doing, your jury is fine, but realize men are living in a mine. Dig it for gold. So yeah, like I said, Gold was a real um, nice uh, lead single. Yeah, the, the label, where they messed up was like, I remember seeing the sticker for the On The Strength album, and it was like, um, what did it say on the sticker? Like, you know, they're back, give them a hug, blah, 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 blah. It was like they were trying to do this promotional thing, but they, they did it half-ass. Like the whole give them a hug thing, they were trying to say, you know, they're, they're, the original group is back together. But, you know, the public already didn't really understand the, the breakup and you know who did what. You know, to this day, there's still a lot of confusion about who's who. And, you know, unless you're really diehard, diehard fan, you don't really necessarily know that this faction did this. You know, some of the stuff that I'm saying here is just not great public knowledge. And in 88, it wasn't great public knowledge. So to do a campaign like that was a good idea, but they needed some kind of video accompaniment to go with it. Whether they did like, a, you know, a, a little documentary, a little 20 minute segment, you know, and, 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 and you know, played it in different places or a video would have been great. So they really, really dropped the ball on the significance of this great group reuniting. But like I said, the one thing they did do, do right was was putting gold out of the first single. And um, I really like gold musically. I like what Flash was doing with the Flash form. I love the way he had uh, the bass line to uh, get on the good foot, you know, so so nice in the background. And you can, you know, hear James Brown's voice in the back. Heard some Baby Huey, listen to me in the background, you know. Um, that was that was the joint. Now the album, that was another story. The album could have been a little better. Um, Interestingly, again, on the actual album, you couldn't get this one song called Back in the Old Days of Hip Hop. And if you got the 45 of gold, it was on the flip side of that. And I believe maybe on the CD, which back then CDs weren't really, you know, very popular yet in 88. But if you had the CD uh, Back in the Old Days of Hip Hop, that was on there. And that was a good song. It was like a throwback. Um, just an ode to, uh, to the hip hop pioneers. This is for Africa Bam Bada. Hey yo, what's up, old boy? Yo, hey yo, remember when Flash used to play that black right stuff and swerve? Right up, the heat below the black hole. Yo, yo, remember we used to watch the Dickie Club? Hey, yo, hey, remember when Clark hit a cool up and say that black stuff? Yo, stay to that cow, oh, boy. Say. Party with the party. Damn with the damn it. Ooh, Flash, baby, boogie ooh. with the boogie is. Huh. Once upon a time in a place the non-fiction. A time when all the newspapers would write about a place called the Bronx whose only distinction a band of builders and street gang fight. Not to clear up a little bit of misconception. And if you're down, you already know. The South Bronx is the place of rap inception. I gotta laugh when they say it ain't so. There used to be a crew rocking on every other block. Uh, back in the old days of hip hop. <laughs> Sit down, Jack. Guaranteed a fact you heard if you wasn't there. Stupid party situation. Fly girls everywhere. 
everywhere. Old turntables, guitar speakers, makeshift mics, huh, and no teachers. Speaking the flash, convicting him to play. He had no electricity. He wanted to play anyway. Equipment was carried, which was understood. Wow, it was set up. The current was built for Fight off a bow, a crack of the round. Feeling fortunate, we knew he was the soldiers of sound. Flash got on the turntables, huh, and played the pop. Back in the old days of hip hop. Good evening, I'm Keith Cowboy. The rest of the group, Grandmaster Flash, along with the Furious Five MCs. We like to say hello to everybody in the house tonight. How many people out there came to have a good time tonight? If you came to have a good time tonight, throw both hands in the air like this. Now listen to this. A record trip for sale, but time to jump a brand. I shake more hands in the prison den. The phone is open, this that ring, get off the hook. You be thinking on my feet, I ought to write a book. My whole house is bummed. Fly Girl was definitely, uh, that was another one. Gold and Fly Girl were, were high points on the album. Um, Fly Girl, they performed that on television, and I want to say it was something like Rick Dees had a show. Uh, 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 it was a late night show. It was either Rick Dees or when, um, it wasn't The Tonight Show. It wasn't, definitely wasn't Arsenio Hall. It was, uh, I can't remember, but anybody out there who has footage Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five performing Fly Girl. I'm definitely interested. We could trade, uh, you know, or we could talk about however I could get that footage. But I definitely need that footage from um, 88, 89 of, uh, of them performing Fly Girl. 
it may have even been when Joan Rivers was filling in for one of those uh, uh, Tonight Show people. It was something like that. I can't remember who it was. And the members of the group, um, one of them had it on VHS or something, and it got damaged or whatever. So, you know, it might be a long shot, but anybody who has it or has access to it, uh, just get at me. Uh, Jaquan at thefoundation.com is the email. Again, Jaquan at thafoundation.com or on social media at uh, Jaquan v- VA. That's J A Y Q U A N V A. Uh, hit me up and let me know if you got that footage. But um, again, not a bad album, but just victims of timing. You know, maybe they could put that album out a couple years earlier. Um, would have been more effective but again you know just that that time in 88 was that was a smoker of a year i mean that was one of the best years for hip-hop records it might be the best year all around for everything that was out from the epmds and everybody else so for for a group you know it had its roots in the 70s um even coming out with something dope it was just a hard time to try to break through but they had a few um dedications to flash on the album um this is where you got it from, basically letting you DJs know Flash was the first, and Flash was doing some really good cuts on the Flash former. Um, and then he had um, The Boys Dope, um, which was you know, another one of his instrumentals. And um, even Magic Carpet Ride, um, which was a remake. But you know, the reunion was short-lived. You know, there were some legal things that were, were going on, and there was a bunch of mess going on that, that you know, I won't get into. But the group in 89, not even a year later, they were reunited with Sylvia Robinson. And uh, ironically, because they had just left in, in, what was it, 83 or whatever, with, you know, when they actually split the first time from the message and everything, the royalty issues and everything. But, um, you know, you got to go where you're able to go. And after the electric thing fell apart, they found themselves back with Sylvia Robinson minus Grandmaster Flash. Now, Sylvia always had a lot of labels, even back before rap records, um, even before rap music, <laughs> you know. Um, she had, like, Stang, Turbo, All Platinum. She always had a, a, a lot of labels going on. In the Sugar Hill days, she had Sweet Mountain, Sugar Hill. Um, at that time, she had probably four or five labels. But um, after Sugar Hill, she had a label called Bon Ami and a label called New Day. In fact, um, interesting tidbit of history um, Bon Ami was the label that uh, Naughty by Nature was on when she had them signed or her son had them signed I think they were going by the name The New Style at that time but uh, they were on Bon Ami Records and uh, New Day Records same same thing um, at one point they had Charlie Wilson of the Gap Band signed to uh, Bon Ami another fun fact was back in the uh, late 80s when uh, Charlie Wilson used to diss Aaron Hall from Guy um, he had a song called Sprung On Me and that was actually put out on uh, on Bone On Me Records um, so anyway that, that was that so um, they found themselves back with Sylvia again minus Flash Flash did not go along but the original MCs were, were back and they had Kid Capri on the Wheels of Steel and they put out an album called Piano and it was very good it was very raw it was just samples they were just rhyming over uh different samples um popular samples uh it was was actually a good album um and i don't i I say that like i'm surprised but i'm saying it was actually a a really good album just you know no promotional dollars no promotion it was just put in the stores and if you heard it you heard it no video or anything you know so uh it didn't really uh make any noise but it was uh it, it was nice to hear them um over some good uh, sample production. And Kid Capri was doing some crazy stuff uh, on the wheels. Symphony written by Tchaikovsky. Baka Beethoven, yo, I'm we get off me. You're sweating and fretting, all upset. You got regrets about letting some female net you. You're starting to spend all your money. Your 
eyes are always runny and honey is always acting funny. Yo, it's sunny. Wake up, smell a bacon. She's faking like Manhattan. Your money making. Ain't she from Brooklyn? She's taking your cash, your stash, your ride, your pride, your heart and soul. She cold stole your bank, bro. She's gonna bust you down the toilet bowl. She plays you like you a game checker, chess, monopoly, or poker. Ain't it a shame? You used to be so macho, my homeboy, my honcho. Clint Eastwood on the western. You used to wear a poncho, a player, smoke and Tipperello. And now she got you wearing what? Pink and yellow? Basin in my face, cause I told you she's cross. Here's a map in the compass, oh boy, cause you lost. Get the bass out your voice, she got you singing a soprano. Break out the sheet music, she played you like a piano. Slow down before you go down the throw down. Better sit, split, hit, get, get, get down. Stay down, play it way down. Say it later, pay down. My gun's son to run you down like a greyhound. Got loose, I got juice. Now shoot, regroup, load up, blow up. Boy, I'm bulletproof. Rough stuff, rough is enough. Plus, I'm tougher. I hump and I puff and you'll suffer. Not bluffing, I'ma tear down the whole stay down. Blow your house down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Countdown. Count out, punch your clock out. A KN OCK punk, a knockout. Knock in, on the lock in. I put my jock in. It was so big, you dig, thought I had a rocket. My pocket hard, big Mac Jack. You know that, you do that. I'm about to shoot that and show throw that. I'm bigger, yes, I'm deafer. That's why you ought to play, take, break off. I have you running like water to shiver in the river, my nigga. Got you living high like a turkey on thank Thanksgiving. Gonna break, meet you, defeat, beat you. And I gotta prove once and for all, you're not a gangster. Boys from the old school, oh no food, not your school, retard, you try to play hard, but you're a slow school dropout, there's no doubt, you try to cop out, we pull the stop out, broke the mop out, then we got the slop out, a knockout, on the lockout, every time we say a rhyme, you got a jock out, you beat out, cut up, get up, spit up, you lit up, and you ducked up, you whined like a pump, you chuffed, you got sucked up, hurt up, tied up, laid up, dried up, we wired the national choir, we got right up, we're older than the old school jam, played by a herc off band, we do work when the party is slammed, but you don't give a damn, cause we made you a believer, but you forgot, so thanks a lot, and now we don't need you. Huh, we taught you like brothers, and not a new school is acting like a bunch of suckers, you sucker. <laughs> Tell the truth about life in the ghetto. On the corner, singing a cappella. I sing bass, you hit the falsetto. A sidewalk symphony like Rigoletto. I pulled out my knife and used it for a microphone. Tapping on the Cadillac for a metronome. You would be a famous striving like an unknown. The crowd gathered round. Imagine it's the Astrodome, the Garden, the Scope, the Apollo, the Palladium, Reunion Arena, or some jam-packed stadium. Now here we are singing into a night. Tapping on the Cadillac. Ghetto life. Mercedes got plenty ladies ain't claiming no babies dropped out of school can't read no doubt it really doesn't matter cause all it does is count a number runner driving in the rental don't use paper or pen or pencil total recall for leaders and combinations you really is a genius but it lacks the education you see that girl she looks good don't date the brothers in the neighborhood she only sees why they high up above I think she got money uh. Uh. somebody said there's no old school, then what are you? A old or a new fool, line you've been trying since 74. Took you 14 years to get your foot in the door. I was your born last week, recorded this past week. Down in the gas leak and asked the brain to be brought back to earth, cold, unemployed. Now you're reincarnated with the Beastie Boy. Wake up, Jack, smell the cappuccino. We've been rocking since you were a little bambino. In the streets of New York, you barely knew how to walk. You try to talk like the boys from the boogie down Bronx. Little broken down bunk, you so wet behind your ears, you need swimming trunks. So open up your eyes, get a last peek. 
first we must dust you off like you was an antique statue to catch you tell you exactly how i make you take you shake you bake you and drop you and break you in the itty bitty pieces black then take you out back and sell you like crack you new jack Yeah, so the piano album could have been a lot better. It could have been, you know, as, as far as success. Uh, if it had some kind of promotion, a video, uh, just if people knew it was out there. People just didn't know that it existed. Unless you happen to go in a record store and, and see this uh, record, even the cover of the album didn't even have a picture of the, uh, of the group. It was just a generic, like, clip art picture of, like, a piano. You know, so it's just very poorly promoted. But, um, you know, you know, Cowboy passed away not too long after that. And, you know, the group reunited a few times, you know, back in the 90s. They did the uh, Raiders of the Lost Art um, compilation where you had a lot of old school groups, Treacherous 3, uh, Bambada, Soul Sonic Force, groups like that uh, putting out music. Uh, I think it was Microphone Slayer and Sun Don't Shine in the Hood were the two songs that the Furious Five contributed and of course, we know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Grammy Hall of Fame, you know, all the accolades that I spoke about on the uh, the first lesson that I did on Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. The group, you know, never did rekindle the magic of the original group, you know, and they were doing, you know, super rapping and, you know, Flash to the Beat and uh, Freedom, you know, those records where they really had that good chemistry and uh, synchronicity. You know, those things that just never was there, even though both sides made uh, good, good music, you know, after the split, you know, one group had, you know, extras or both group had extras. And, um, you know, it just wasn't it wasn't the magic that we came to know, you know, know the Furious Five for. And I, I've I've really hoped over the years that they would um, resolve whatever differences they had and, and get back together as a unit. But as the years go on, of course, the uh, the chances that happen, you know, these things have happened to make them very slim. But uh, a great group nonetheless. Now, their, um, their solo output, of course, I've covered Mel's solo stuff more than adequately throughout these last couple lessons. But in 86, uh, Scorpio had a song called um, Go, Michael, Go Michael Air Jordan. It was a dedication to Michael Jordan, and it was on... Um, Arthur Baker's label, Criminal Records. And uh, Jazzy J was on the wheels, and um, definitely a solid effort. Because I got to drew, but I dare you just look and assume. So don't call me a 
You've heard me in these various lessons talk about Raheem's uh, talent for uh, harmonizing and singing, and uh, he hit it. He hit it big and on the head uh, on a Juice soundtrack. I think that was '91, the, the Juice movie with, uh, of course, with Tupac's big, you know, movie debut. On the soundtrack, Raheem had a song called "Does Your Man Know About Me," and uh, it was a pretty big song and it was a very good song. Uh, I still listen to that one um, pretty often. Everything came together on that one. I think he was working with uh, the Bomb Squad, who were you know PE's producers, and um, who did some other work on the soundtrack. And the music was just right, and uh, definitely a good work by Raheem. 2 a.m. and I'm awakened by the telephone. She said he's gone. I said he's gone. She said he's gone. I noticed that her voice had a slight hint of desperation. I thought, hmm, I couldn't resist the temptation. And she said he'd be gone for a while. There on my face appeared a wicked little smile. Not feeling the least bit of guilt, cause what for? Cause all is fan love and war. Yeah, so it's not really much more that can be said. You know, the music spoke for itself. Definitely uh, a great group. One of the greatest, definitely, in the uh, in the annals of the genre. And this is your man, Jaquan. You can hit me up at jaquan at thefoundation.com, T-H-A foundation.com. The website is thefoundation.com, T-H-A foundation.com. Hit me on all social media at Jaquan VA. Peace.
Finding you. Finding who? 